Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan and today we're tackling pyloric stenosis. So as always, let's kick it off with our practice question. The nurse is assessing an infant with suspected pyloric stenosis. Which of the following findings would support that diagnosis? Select all that apply. We have A, weight gain, B, projectile vomiting, C, an olive-shaped abdominal mass, D, anorexia, and E, a failure to pass the meconium stool. All right, tuck that answer away. We'll come back to it at the end. First, a quick refresher on the anatomy and what this disorder is. So first, pyloric stenosis, what's the pylorus? This is a small but mighty little muscular valve that sits at the bottom of the stomach. I want you to think of it as the door that basically controls the flow of stomach contents into the duodenum. And remember, that's the first part of our small intestine, okay? So it's the door. When the door opens, we get that food moving from stomach to intestines. When it is closed, we keep that food in the stomach. And we need to do that so the stomach can start digesting our food with gastric juices and enzymes. Remember, it churns it up, like moves it around and turns it into that chyme. Then the pylorus sphincter opens, so that door opens and that chyme moves into the duodenum so it can start absorbing nutrients. So now, pyloric stenosis, what happens? That pyloric sphincter, that muscular valve, becomes hypertrophied, meaning it is too thick. That muscle grows, tightens, and basically the door gets jammed. So food just can't pass through. It is stuck in the stomach. So that's where the symptoms of this disorder come from. Basically, we're going to have an infant eating. The milk goes into the stomach as usual, but it hits that door of the hypertrophied pyloric sphincter. It can't move from the stomach to the duodenum. So pressure builds up in the stomach and eventually forces everything back out. And it doesn't happen gently. We have projectile vomiting. Sometimes it literally shoots across the room. I have seen it hit the wall in the room in the emergency department. So it's a classic, very dramatic sign. It's definitely more than typical reflux. If it hits the wall, that projectile vomiting, that is a big key. All right. Now, despite all of this vomiting, babies with pyloric stenosis are still really hungry all the time because they're not absorbing anything, right? Food going into belly, coming right back out. So the problem isn't their appetite. It's that jammed door between the stomach and intestines. They can't keep anything down, so they lose weight. They get dehydrated. We can have electrolyte imbalances going on. As you get into your physical exam, there's another very distinctive symptom, and it is an olive-shaped mass, usually in the upper right quadrant. And basically, you are just feeling that thick and stiffened, hypertrophied pyloric sphincter. It's kind of round, so it is an olive-shaped mass, all right? Now, a quick little tip. It's usually easiest to palpate this when the stomach is empty, right after one of those projectile vomiting episodes. So quick recap here. We have a thickened pyloric muscle. We're thinking of this as the door between the stomach and the intestines. The door gets jammed. We have a blocked gastric outlet. Food cannot move from belly to small intestine. That means that we retain that food. The pressure builds up. We have projectile vomiting. That leads into our weight loss and dehydration. So my story for you today on pyloric stenosis actually comes from urgent care. So this baby was eventually sent over to the emergency department. I saw the case in an urgent care. It was a four-week-old baby boy. I think he was just about to be a month old. Parents brought him in for vomiting. Chief complaint of vomiting was what's up on the board. I bring them back, start doing their little triage, getting vitals, et cetera, talking to the parents. So story from mom is 
He's throwing up everything that it eats. It started off with just like spit up, you know, baby spit up a lot. That can be super normal. They had brought him to the pediatrician about a week prior to this. They said it's reflux, you know, feed him sitting up, small frequent feeds, don't over distend his belly, all that usual stuff. And mom's like, no, I just know that this is not reflux. This is not normal. It's getting worse and worse. Now it's not just like a little spit up. He is projectile vomiting. That vomit is like going across the room, hitting the wall. So when she used that word projectile, that caught my attention. Projectile vomiting is very different from spit up. That is a red flag. Spit up, not a red flag. If that emesis is flying out of their mouth, hitting the wall, something else is going on. So my follow-up question is, okay, uh, you know, he's vomiting, so something must be going in his belly. Is he eating okay? And their response immediately was like, oh my gosh, yeah, he's eating all the time. He's starving. We feed him, he throws up, and he wants more. So that's another little light bulb moment. Hungry after vomiting tells us we've got this mechanical obstruction. It's not like an infection or a GI bug, because then they wouldn't be hungry after they puked. All right, we do vitals. Honestly, his vitals were fine. There was nothing like, oh my gosh, call 911. I do get his weight though and note that it is under his birth weight. So that I do not like at four weeks. Birth weight does typically drop when they go home, just as a side note. But we usually want that back up to birth weight by two weeks. By four weeks, they should be above their birth weight. Okay, so under birth weight, I don't really like. I also always ask about How many wet and dirty diapers have they had? And he had only had three in the past 24 hours. We really want a minimum of six, and often it is more in a four-week-old baby. So I ask about that, especially if we've got vomiting or anything like that, because it tells me about dehydration. That's one of the best ways to assess dehydration in a pediatric client. How many wet diapers do they have? Okay. So we've got this projectile vomiting after eating. He's hungry. He eats. He vomits. He's dehydrated. His weight is dropping. All of this is aiming me towards, I'm thinking we potentially have pyloric stenosis, okay? So the key assessment I want to do is abdominal palpation. I want to feel that belly, upper white quadrant, and poke around there, see if we have an olive-shaped mass. That small, firm, round, kind of like nodule feeling, that is the hypertrophied pyloric muscle. I couldn't feel it just immediately. I really had to do some deeper palpation there. And that makes sense for an infant who has just started having the projectile vomiting. It hasn't hypertrophied to the point where it's super obvious yet. Sometimes you can't even feel it. I was able to feel it a little bit, though. So all those signs put together really pointed me towards pyloric stenosis. I do want to note one more thing. He did actually have a projectile vomiting episode while he was in the urgent care when I was triaging him. And it's important to note what that vomit, what that emesis actually looks like, okay? It's going to look just like the milk that went in. That milk's going in and it's coming right back out. So it's not digested. It's not bilious. It hasn't gotten into the intestines yet where bile is released. So that non-bilious factor of the vomiting is very important. If it's something like intussusception or, you know, it's it's an infection, a virus, a tummy bug, then that food's going to get into the intestine. And when we have vomiting, it's going to be digested and bilious. So that non-bilious projectile vomiting He's hungry right after he eats. He's losing weight. He's dehydrated. I can feel that olive-shaped mass. I'm really suspecting pyloric stenosis. So in the urgent care where I was working, we could go ahead and do some initial labs. Where we were was it was almost set up like a little mini ED. We had imaging and labs right there on site. So we went ahead and got a CMP. We got some electrolytes, all that sort of jazz. On his blood gas, he had a slight metabolic alkalosis, which made sense given how much vomiting he's had. He's losing a lot of that gastric acid, less acid, that pH is going up, so he's getting alkalotic. His electrolytes were a little out of whack with that dehydration. 
And then we went ahead and got an ultrasound, which was able to visualize that pyloric sphincter, that little muscle, that door there was elongated and thickened. So the doctor was able to confirm pyloric stenosis. So now moving forward, what do we do about it? In urgent care, there was only a little bit we could do before we actually moved him or transferred him over to the hospital, but I was able to get him some fluids. He was dehydrated. We went ahead, I had placed an IV when I did his labs. So we went ahead and got some fluids going to help with that. That was kind of the extent of what we could do at urgent care. He was referred over to the hospital from there. They gave him electrolyte replacement, you know, corrected that alkalosis, got all those labs back where we needed them to be. But overall, what had to happen was he had to go to surgery. They needed to relieve that door jam. We had to decompress that belly, get that door opened up so food could actually move from the belly to the intestine. So the following treatment should be placing an NG tube. We're going to decompress that belly, get everything out of there, relieve the pressure. He's NPO. We're prepping for surgery. Uh, and they do what's called a pylorotomy. So they slice through that thickened muscle, open up that door jam, and boom, food can move from belly into stomach. And the baby gets a lot better really quickly. Post-op, you watch out for infection, hydration status, you slowly reintroduce oral feeds. But I'm happy to say this is a case that usually recovers very, very quickly. The baby's super happy because they can eat and it actually goes all the way through their GI tract. They're not dehydrated. They start gaining weight. They usually go home a content baby and very relieved parents. So all that being said, what I really want you taking away are those specific signs and symptoms. You are the first line. You're the first person who's going to see and hear this story. So know those red flags that stick out so we know to escalate this case. With that being said, I want to bring you back to our practice question to make sure you can get to the right answer and understand why. So you are assessing an infant with suspected pyloric stenosis. Tell me which of these symptoms would support that diagnosis. Would it be A, weight gain, B, projectile vomiting, C, an olive-shaped abdominal mass, D, anorexia, or E, a failure to pass the meconium stool? Remember that select all that apply. So go through in your head, tick off which ones of those tell us, hey, this could be pyloric stenosis. All right, starting with A, our weight gain. What do you say? No, we're going to be seeing weight loss. They're having vomiting. They're not digesting their food. Weight will be going down. What about B, projectile vomiting? Yes, that is one of our key red flags. Projectile, non-bilious emesis. Write it down if you don't already know it. You've got to remember that one. Huge buzzword for pyloric stenosis. Now see your olive-shaped abdominal mass. Yes, another buzzword. Olive-shaped mass. That's that hypertrophied pyloric sphincter, usually in the upper right quadrant of the belly. Easiest to feel it when that belly is empty after a vomiting episode. What about D, our anorexia? Remember that means, you know, we don't really have an appetite. We're not eating. No, one of our key differentiators with pyloric stenosis is they are hungry. Food goes in and comes out. They want to eat again. It's not like with a tummy bug. You know, we've got norovirus, rotavirus or anything. They're not going to have an appetite. With pyloric stenosis, they want to eat. So D, incorrect. That would not support pyloric stenosis. And lastly, E, how about that failure to pass the meconium stool? No, incorrect. If we don't pass the meconium stool, I'm thinking potentially Hirschsprungs, maybe cystic fibrosis. But with pyloric stenosis, that is not the issue. They will have passed their meconium, hopefully in that normal 24 to 48 hour period. But now they're having that projectile vomiting. So if there's anything you take away from this episode, I want you to know your key buzzwords for this disorder projectile non-bilious emesis, and that olive-shaped mass. Remember, you are the first line here. When you hear these symptoms, make sure you're putting the pieces together and advocating for your client. 
right, future nurses? That is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.